Terra Mystica is a strategic worker management fantasy building game that pits two to five players against each other to transform the landscape and build structures that provide resources, compete to reach the highest space on the cult track, and gain as much power as they can before the end of the sixth round, all the while collecting the most victory points to become the greatest faction in a thriving magical world. Games will last about 30 minutes per player, and the difficulty rating is 3.9 out of 5. To start, place the game board on the center of the table and place the cult board next to it. Then, determine the starting player and give them the starting player token. The rulebook states that the starting player is whoever has most recently dug a planting bed in their garden. The rulebook has an introductory game setup for new players. If this is your first time playing, consider setting up the game the way it suggests. In this video, however, I will be explaining how to set up the game normally. Beginning with a starting player and going around the table clockwise, players will take turns choosing one of 14 different factions. Every faction has two unique special abilities that set them apart from the rest. One you will have from the beginning of the game on, and the other you will get when you build your stronghold. Check out the back of the rulebook for a description of these special abilities. Place your chosen faction board in front of you and take your corresponding colored game pieces. Each piece has a special place on your faction board and has its own unique use in the game. Dwellings will be used to claim land on the game board and will provide you with more workers. In Terra Mystica, your structures can be upgraded. Each upgrade gives you certain benefits. Dwellings can be upgraded to trading houses, which provide you with coins and power. Trading houses can be upgraded to either a stronghold, which unlocks your faction's second special ability, or a temple, which will provide you with priests. And finally, temples can be upgraded to a sanctuary, which will make it easier to found a town. In addition to your structures, your faction board also contains power tokens and markers. Power tokens are placed within your bowls of power according to the number written within the bowl on your faction board. Markers are used to keep track of the progress of different abilities. Place one on the leftmost space of your shipping track, one on the bottommost space of your exchange track, another on space 20 of the victory point track around the border of the game board, and finally distribute your remaining four markers on space zero of each of the four tracks on the cult board. You should now have seven priests and three bridges left. Keep these in front of you to use during the game. At this time, players will refer to the top right corner of their faction board where they'll find a depiction of their starting resources. Take these depicted resources now and keep them for later. These are cult symbols. For each cult symbol, move your corresponding marker forward one space on that cult board. Now shuffle the eight scoring tiles face down and randomly place six of them on the scoring tile spaces on the game board face up, one at a time, beginning with space six. If you happen to draw one with a spade on the left side for rounds five or six, place it aside and draw another one instead, then shuffle it back into the remaining tiles and continue. Finally, cover the right half of the scoring tile on the sixth space with the game end token. Place the remaining two scoring tiles back in the box. Next, grab the nine bonus cards and shuffle them face down. Randomly draw three more cards than there are players and place them near the game board. In this example, I'm playing with four players. Since I need three more cards than there are players, I have randomly chosen seven bonus cards. Place the remaining bonus cards back in the game box. Now grab all the favor tiles and town tiles and place them in stacks next to the game board. Favor tiles are awarded when a player builds temples or their sanctuary, and town tiles whenever you build a town. Finally, grab six action tokens and place one above each power action at the bottom of the game board. The time has come to place your first dwellings. Beginning with the starting player and then in clockwise order, each player will place one of his dwellings on an existing home terrain on the game board. You can find your faction's home terrain on top of your transformation circle. Then, beginning with the last player and in counterclockwise order, place a second dwelling in the same fashion. The Nomad's first special ability lets them place a third dwelling after all players have placed their second. Always remove structures from your faction board from left to right. Now, beginning with the last player and again in counterclockwise order, each player will choose one bonus card. After all players have chosen their bonus cards, place one coin on each of the three that are left over. And that's set up. Everything is ready to go, and the game is about to begin. Terra Mystica takes place over six rounds. Each round has three phases. At the beginning of every round is the income phase. Look for all of the income symbols which look like an open hand on your faction board and on your bonus card, and gain all the resources listed. 
Take a look under some of your structures. You'll notice all of your structures are hiding income symbols. To gain access to this income at the beginning of future rounds, you'll need to build these structures. Income could be in the form of workers, coins, priests, or power. When you gain power, you don't collect new power tokens. Rather, you'll move them around from bowl to bowl. You must always move power from bowl 1 first until it is empty, then you may begin moving power from bowl 2 into bowl 3. During the game, you will spend power to use power actions. You may only spend power that is in bowl 3. After spending power, you'll move the number of power tokens spent from bowl 3 back into bowl 1 and the process repeats. You do not need bowl 1 or bowl 2 to be empty in order to use power actions. You just need enough power in bowl 3. After everyone has collected their income at the beginning of the round, it's time to start the action phase. Beginning with the starting player, players will take turns in clockwise order doing any one action. There are eight actions to choose from. On a player's turn, if they choose not to perform an action, they will pass and sit out for the rest of the round. The other players continue taking turns in clockwise order, skipping over all players who have passed until every player has decided they are done taking actions. Make sure to take note of the left half of this round's scoring tile. Anyone who builds the indicated feature will gain victory points every time they build it during this round. The first action is Transform and Build. The essence of Terra Mystica is transforming terrain spaces. This is done by spending spades. Look at the space you wish to transform, then find that terrain type on your transformation circle. Count how many spades separate the current terrain type from the terrain you wish to transform it into. Now take a look at your exchange track for the current worker cost per spade. Spend the appropriate amount of workers, which in this case is 6, and place the new terrain tile on the space you transformed. In order to build a dwelling, the terrain space you wish to build on must be of your faction's home terrain. It must also be directly or indirectly adjacent to a pre-existing structure that you own. Direct adjacency means it is immediately next to one of your other structures or bridges. Indirect adjacency means they are separated by river spaces. If these conditions are met, you may pay the cost depicted on your faction board and build your dwelling. With this action, you may transform one space and or place one dwelling on that space. You are not required to do both. You may choose to do one or the other, but you may not transform a space and then place a dwelling on a different space in the same turn. You may only transform or build on an unoccupied space, no destroying your opponent's structures. Take a look at your faction board. You'll notice that all structures have a power value listed next to them. This comes into play in two ways. The first is when you are attempting to build a town. When you have at least four structures directly adjacent to each other with a combined power value of 7, you may take a town tile of your choice. You receive the bonuses displayed on that tile. You'll then place it underneath one of the structures in your newly created town. Whenever you build a town, you also get a key. Keys are used to unlock the 10th space on a cult track. Only one player may advance to each space 10. If you wish to advance to another cult track's 10th space, you must obtain another key. The second way power values of structures come into play is when an opponent builds or upgrades a structure directly adjacent to you. When they do, add up the power value of all of your structures directly adjacent to that one they just built or upgraded, and gain that much power. Unfortunately, this power is not free. In order to gain it, you must lose a number of victory points equal to one less than the number of power you are gaining. This is why everyone begins the game with 20 points. So for instance, if an opponent builds next to my dwelling and trading house, which have a combined power value of 3, I must lose one less, or two victory points, in order to gain that 3 power. This is all or nothing. You have to take all of the power or take none at all. But of course, if you take none, you won't lose any victory points either. You'll notice the cost of a trading house says 3 or 6. The normal cost of a trading house is 6 coins, but if you build a trading house directly adjacent to an opponent, you get a discount and you only have to pay 3 coins. The trade-off is that they will then have the opportunity to gain power since you've just built directly adjacent to them. The second action is to advance on the shipping track. Your shipping is important because it helps you cross river spaces. As an action, you may pay the required cost and increase your shipping value by 1 and gain the depicted victory points. From now on, you'll be able to cross over one river space. 
The next time you upgrade your shipping, you may cross two river spaces, which will help you build further away. These two dwellings are indirectly adjacent to each other because this player's shipping value allows them to travel two river spaces. Where shipping gives you indirect adjacency, bridges offer a unique way to achieve direct adjacency across a river space. You can build a bridge using a power action, which we'll go over in a minute. A bridge can be built next to one of your structures anywhere you see an unfinished bridge on the game board. Once a bridge is built, you may use the transform and build action on a later turn to alter the space on the other side. The third action is to lower the exchange rate for spades. Transforming requires spades, and spades cost a lot of workers. If you choose to decrease your worker to spade ratio, you may choose this action, pay the required cost, and move your marker to reflect the change. This action will also reward you with victory points. The fourth action lets you upgrade a structure. To do so, you must pay the depicted cost and replace the appropriate structure with a new one. This will, among other things, reveal new and different income bonuses for future rounds. Return the replaced structure to your faction board. Remember that when you return that structure to your faction board, you're now losing the income bonus that it provided. The fifth action allows you to send a priest to the order of a cult. If you currently have priests in your supply, you may choose to send one of them to the cult board. Choose a cult track, place your priest on one of the numbers below your chosen track, and move your colored marker forward that many spaces. Your priest will remain there for the rest of the game. You only have seven priests, so use them wisely. You may pass some power symbols along the way. If you do, gain that much power. The cult track is important for cult bonuses at the end of the round, and also victory points at the end of the game. Look at the right half of each scoring tile. You'll notice they have cult symbols and a resource. Each player with enough progress in the depicted cult gets the reward at the end of the round, multiple times, if need be. There are a number of ways to acquire priests. You can get them from this power action, from this bonus card, by taking this town tile, and also by being far enough on the water track during a round where this scoring tile is in play. The other two ways are via temples and sanctuaries. Having these structures built at the beginning of a round will grant you priests as income. In addition to providing priests, sanctuaries have another benefit. They allow you to found the town in which they reside with only three structures as opposed to the usual four. Keep in mind, you still need seven power even to found a town with only three structures. That is, unless you have this favor tile, which allows you to found a town with only six power. Also, whenever you build a temple or a sanctuary, you immediately take a favor tile of your choice as indicated here on your faction board. These all allow you to advance on the depicted call track, but in addition to that, most of them give you other benefits as well. The sixth action you can take is to use a power action. These are listed along the bottom of the game board. To be able to use your chosen power action, you must be able to pay its indicated cost. This one lets you build a bridge over a river space. This one gives you a priest. This one gives you two workers. This one gives you seven coins. This one is the same as a transform and build action, but provides you with one free spade to use. And this one gives you two free spades, which is better. If you do not have enough spades to transform a space into your home terrain, you may use workers to make up the missing spades based on your current exchange rate. Any spades you have that you do not use during this turn are wasted. It is possible, however, to transform multiple adjacent spaces during one turn, provided you have transform the first space into your home terrain and still have leftover spades. At this point, though, you can't use workers to gain additional spades. After transforming multiple spaces, you may build a dwelling on the first space you transformed. Power actions are first come, first served. After you take one, cover its orange hex with an action token. This will prevent other players from using it until the next round. Take a look under bowl three. You'll notice a conversion chart here. This chart can be used at any time on your turn. None of these conversions require an action. If you have the appropriate amount of power in bowl three, you may spend it to gain either a priest, a worker, or a coin. Also, at any time on your turn, you can convert a priest into a worker, or a worker into a coin. That's not very economical, but can really help you out of a bind. Remember to move spent power tokens from bowl 3 back to bowl 1. Bowl 2 has a special power of its own. If at any time you do not have enough power in bowl 3 to take an action, you may move power tokens from bowl 2 into bowl 3. However, for every power token you move in this way, you must sacrifice one power token from Bowl 2 and remove it from the game. 
You can never get it back, so sacrifice power at your own discretion. The seventh action allows you to use a special action, which contain an orange hex, indicating that they may only be used once per round. Certain favor tiles and bonus cards contain these special actions, and most strongholds have a special action that can be used after your stronghold is built. After using the action, cover the orange hex with an action token until the next round. Finally, by using the eighth action, you may pass. If you're the first one to pass this round, take the starting player token. You will now be the starting player when the next round begins. After passing, choose a new bonus card from the three remaining cards and return your old one. If there are coins laying on the new card you've chosen, those are yours to keep. Certain bonus cards give you victory points when you return them. For example, this card gives you two points for every trading house you have on the game board when you return it. After every player has passed, the cult bonuses and cleanup phase begins. Players first look at the right half of the scoring tile for this round. As mentioned before, each player with enough progress in the depicted cult gets the reward, and they will get it multiple times if need be. For example, this piece is on space 6 of the fire cult track. They will receive three workers as a cult bonus. When acquiring spades in this phase, you may transform land directly or indirectly adjacent to you immediately. This is not a transform and build action, so you may not build a dwelling at this time. Also, you may never save spades for later. They all must be used immediately, or they are lost. Now it's time to clean up. Remove all action tokens from orange hexes, put one coin on the three leftover bonus cards, even if there's some there already, flip the previous turn scoring tile face down, and proceed to the next round. Players will continue round after round until the sixth round ends. At this time, players will receive cult scoring bonuses and area scoring bonuses. Each of the four cult tracks will be scored individually. Whoever is highest on each track will get eight points. Next highest is four points, and third highest is two points. In the event of a tie, you will split the points of the respective tiers between the tied players. For example, blue and yellow are both tied for highest on the earth track. Since they are in first and second, they will split eight plus four points. So in other words, they both get six points. For area scoring, determine which player has the most structures directly or indirectly connected to each other. Depending on your shipping value, scattered areas may be indirectly adjacent and thus connected. This player will get 18 victory points because they have the most connected structures. Second most gets 12 victory points, and these two players are tied for third. They will both receive three victory points each. There is no cult bonuses and cleanup phase after round six. That is why it is covered by the game end token. Whoever has the most victory points is the winner. And that's your no BS guide on how to play Terra Mystica. If you enjoyed this video, please comment, like it, and subscribe for more. Thanks for watching.